Well, we're glad to be with you. This is a little bit different than the days where we do a radio recording. But the Lord laid it on my heart. I've been wanting to do this for a very long time. And for many years, when I was, my wife and I were training and my wife birthing all 10 of our children and training them, we do have a Christian school from which they all graduated, Praise, Power, and Prayer Christian School. And over the years, many people have asked my wife, they've asked me, they've even asked our children who are now all grown and many having families for themselves all through the first round of college, all 10 of them. And often it was asked, even by unsaved relatives, when they watched our children at family gatherings and they watched how our children were, they saw the standards uh, by which we were raising them, they often had honest questions. How did you do it with 10 children? They said, you know, they would say things like, there's not a bad apple in the whole bunch. <laughs> and, I, and of course, in my own spirit, my wife and I, and, and after a while, one of my uncles, who I believe is now home with the Lord for years after a gathering of celebrating the birth of Christ and lots of wonderful singing, when the evening was wrapping up, he'd ask either my wife or I or both to see if we would ever change our mind, I think. What do you attribute it to? And near the end of his life, he'd look at me with a smile and said, I know what you're going to say. It's Jesus. <laughs> but other people have even asked my wife to serve on panels. My children have gone out and shared with others. And what the Lord told me as a young married man, a young father, was to pour the word of God in my children. A double portion of the word of God. If you look at the great contest between Elijah and the false prophets, an amazing story. One of the things that he did is he filled the trench with a double portion of the grain. And God told me that if I will do that, he will water it. And it will. It says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he shall not depart from it. And we have witnessed this in our family, not through psychology, not through talent, athletics, music, although my children have gifts like everyone else, and not of intellect, though they be book smart. It was because of the word of God. And I know that it has a powerful effect and can still have a redeeming effect even to grown-ups. Because you see, when I was when I came to Christ and he saved me, he, as it were, knocked me off of my own horse and got my attention, told me what I must do to be saved. But early on, I needed training as a young man out of college, really a simpleton with no a very intelligent man, 99th percentile in all of the standardized tests in the country, got degrees from two colleges, and yet I was ignorant of God, ignorant of his words. I knew about the name Jesus. I grew up in a religion that kind of kept Jesus on the cross. Now, we do preach the cross, but let me tell you, he is risen. He is not here. He is sitting at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. So how did I train myself? One of the main books he led me into early on, of course, I read as much scripture in the whole Bible, the Gospels, everything I could. The book of Hebrews was a big help to me, particularly, though, the book of Proverbs. And at the time, I did not know that I would be pastoring this church and that I would be working at this Christian school for now the last 30 years with 20 plus graduating classes and many more that came for seasons, times and seasons, and then moved on to other schools. But that while they were here, the word of God was planted in them. Now, I know we got a little bit of a late start today. We're trying to make all of this work between YouTube and then linking it to Facebook and Facebook linked to emails and texts so that more people with the platforms we have can listen in. And I have so much information I'd like to cover, and it won't be done just simply tonight. So with, with your grace, I hope that you will stay tuned every week, or at least if you can't tune in on a Friday night, 
you can find it by going to Pastor Raymond McMahon on Facebook. More people are asking for friend requests. I'm confirming them. I'm, I'm very excited to be able to speak to many people that I know and love locally, but also that I've met on Facebook. Saints all over the world, all over the country, who are grappling with what we see going on around us in, in our age, particularly now with this coronavirus and all of the different things that people are wrestling with, perhaps loss of income, health challenges. What really is going on with this whole apparent government takeover of everything? Well, saints, don't be afraid. It's time to look up. Jesus said, when you see these things, look up for your redemption draws nigh. So into the book of Proverbs chapter one. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. And it has a semicolon there. This is very important to understand that the bulk of the Proverbs of Solomon, later on we learn that I believe Hezekiah and others collected them and put them in to the book that we have today, the book of Proverbs chapters 1 through 31. But the Proverbs of Solomon, and it specifically gives the historical note that he was the son of David, the king of Israel. And there is a purpose laid out, which is so important to understand in the first six verses. Because if you're going to follow along with this, we're going to be going into many other scriptures related to the fear of the Lord, relating to the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ relating to wisdom, knowledge, instruction, holiness, good, sound advice from the Word of God. And I am so thankful that the Lord put a desire in me to study this book. But right from the beginning, before we begin the actual teaching, which begins in verse 7, with the words, the fear of the Lord, there is a reason an outline for why this book is so important. And I don't want to get stalled on this, but let's look at it. The first thing, there's seven things, and I didn't want to force the number seven into this list, but it kind of came out nicely like that. Number one, to know wisdom and instruction. To know could mean to be intimate with, to recognize wisdom and instruction. Secondly, to perceive, to give us, what's the word? Discernment. To perceive the words of understanding. Thirdly, the ability to receive the instruction of four things. The instruction of wisdom. The instruction of justice. The instruction of judgment. And it's not about judging people into hell or being judgmental, but it has to do with sound judgment. You have to do that with your own children when you evaluate their behavior. And sound equity. You know how children suddenly get that attitude, you know, as they're going through grades four through seven. N nothing is fair. It's not fair. Well, we're not talking about that. We're talking about genuine equity genuine scriptural divine fairness. So the first thing was to know wisdom and instruction. Notice that they're paired. Secondly, to perceive, to receive discernment, to, to perceive, to catch on to that words of understanding here are being spoken. Then to receive the ability to get it into you, to receive this is why studying the book of Proverbs, all of these things will happen in your life, in the life of your teenagers. You know, I had a liberal arts education, and I can tell you that it did not promote godliness and virtue in me. And it doesn't mean that it was inherently and intently evil, but there was a lot of rebellion in it, a lot of arrogance, a lot of intellectual pride, and a lot of getting people to question even the very existence of God. So that's not doing anybody any favors. Some people think they're smarter because they don't believe in God, like they have more common sense than the believers. Well, I'll have a few things to say if you'll stay tuned over the weeks and months about that. 
So I want to, from my own self, I need, I knew I needed to receive that fourfold instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. Equity in your dealings with people, even with family, with business partners, in the professional life, in churches. And then the next one is, this is so important, to give subtlety to the simple. See, there's two people here listed in verse 4 of Proverbs 1. Subtlety to the simple, and this is so important, and I found it to be true for my, my, my sons and daughters, that the book of Proverbs, the study of it, will give to the young man, and young men need this. So many have no father today in the home. Well, the mothers can lead them into the book of Proverbs. Local men of faith and ministers, hopefully living holy lives, and lives that are beyond reproach, both in public and in private, I might add, that the book of Proverbs will give two important things that young men need to know, and young women, for that matter, two things, knowledge and discretion, the ability to make wise choices. Discretion means you got your eyes in your head. You're not off wandering in your mind. Watch out for the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. John wrote about that, the Apostle John. For if those things are in you, you do not have yet the love of the Father in you. Verse 5, I divided it up into 6a and 6b. A wise man will hear and will increase learning. You see, a wise man just doesn't, if they have real wisdom, they don't just want to learn so they can have knowledge. They want to do something with what they received. They're like the River Jordan that flows into the teeming, full of life Sea of Galilee. And the rivers leave also and water the plains. You don't want to be like the Dead Sea where you just learn and learn and learn and learn, but you have no desire to minister to anyone else to share what you've learned, to get excited about what you're studying, will increase learning. And a man of understanding shall attain. Notice the word attain. This is not passive. You see, the simpleton will remain passive. Years ago, we used to watch a show on TV called Hogan's Heroes, and there was a character that was played as kind of a goofy guy part of the German military who was watching over the POWs in, in, in the prison, Stalag 13, I think they called it. And Sergeant, uh, I forget his name, but the Sergeant would always say, I see nothing. I know nothing. Because Hogan and his heroes were always up to something and they knew they could pull the wool over this guy's eyes. He just wanted to do his job. He didn't want to know what they were up to, like digging escape tunnels. But you see, Attaining is not a passive thing. Attaining is not a religious action. Attaining is a desire of the heart. And you attain not just for more knowledge to be appear more spiritually minded, because you want to find wise counsels, which means you acknowledge that you don't have it all, that you can learn from others, especially God. There is a passion when I start studying the Word of God. I read a book right here, you can see it, called The Unbreakable Covenant of Marriage, the thing I primarily speak of on the radio. And you can get a copy of this. Maybe my son will break in later and tell you how to get a copy of this book, $20. We don't get a dime from this except to support the radio ministry. But this is so important because our families are falling apart. They're falling apart. Not every family, but many families now are blended but it might actually be in the spirit of adultery that Christ taught. Some of you may not even have a clue as to why I just said what I said. But if you have Facebook and you find me at Pastor Raymond McMahon, you can scroll down and hear many messages. As a matter of fact, you can go to our website at praisepowerprayertemplect.org. Hit the radio link and you can find hundreds of archive broadcasts on the covenant of marriage. 
And that is a real blessing to me and to all of my children and to everyone that attends at Praise Power and Prayer Temple. You see, a wise man will hear and will increase learning. A man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. And lastly, in Proverbs 1, 6, as I have listed it as 7a and b in the sevenfold purpose of this book, it's actually not just to read and memorize a proverb, friend, and say, I can quote it. There's something far more important than that. And that's good. It is good to do that. But that's not enough. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise, and their dark sayings. Now, that's an interesting term, dark sayings. And what I would like to share with you is I believe that their dark sayings of the wise are hidden from pride. They are hidden from the natural and carnal mind of man. They are hidden from active sinners who don't really care one way or another. Now, the devil quoted some words from the Psalms to Jesus in what we call the temptations. He was quoting one of the Psalms. I believe it was 95. I could be wrong. Maybe 91. But he didn't really quote it perfectly. And of course, he was abusing the use of the scripture when tempting our great Savior, Jesus. But I want you to understand when it says they're dark sayings, he's not talking about hidden, special, only to superior believers, a Gnostic, a Gnosticism where it's only for certain select saints. It has nothing to do with Gnosticism when it says they're dark sayings. It means it's hidden from the foolish. It's hidden from the proud. It's hidden from the carnal or natural mind. And yet, the whole purpose of the book can bring all of this, what I see as a sevenfold purpose of the book, into your life first and into the lives of colleagues, children, grandchildren. I, you know, they have so many things you can buy, Bible curriculums and things for children. I never did that with my children. I actually taught them the actual word of God from the womb. And I wasn't worried that it would go over their head. What they didn't need to know went over their head. What they could glean from it, they gleaned something from it. But one thing they knew about me and mom, we meant this, and we know we needed it for ourselves. That's why I want to encourage all of you that end up listening by YouTube as we made it public and or by um, Facebook uh, Live, the, 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 the saving of these things. I don't know all of the technology. I'm just thankful it's there. So what is the very first teaching verse after the introduction? Number seven. This starts it off right here. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Now, I want you to understand that there are three things in the, in the book of Proverbs that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of. It's the beginning of knowledge, and we'll later on we'll run into a verse that says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of understanding and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Why is that important? Because every time you see the words knowledge, wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, the fear of the Lord even, it all has its roots in the fear of the Lord. So when Christ has made wisdom for us, the wisdom that came from above, James wrote, is first pure, then peaceable gentle, easy to be entreated, full of good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. However, the wisdom that comes from beneath, it's sensual and devilish. The Bible says of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you will turn with me to Hebrews chapter 5, this is Paul's letter to the, the Jews that were scattered abroad who came to faith in their Messiah, Jesus Christ, is the Messiah of the Jews. He came as the Lamb of God first. He is coming again as the mighty Lion of Judah. And he is going to defend his own country and people 
that he descended from when the armies of the Antichrist will someday, and I think it's sooner than later, they're going to try to surround Jerusalem and destroy anything of the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's how evil the peoples of the world will be. And so in Hebrews chapter 5, we read about Jesus. In verse 5, So also Christ glorified him not himself to be made an high priest. You see, Jesus, according to the prophecies, the Christ, the Messiah, was going to descend from, king, from the tribe of Judah and specifically from King David. So he was not a Levite. And so Paul accurately writes to his Jewish brethren who knew the Old Testament, so also Christ glorified it, not himself to be made an high priest. But quoting Psalm 10, Paul says, but he that said unto him in Psalm 2, thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. Paul now refers to Psalm 110 about this Messiah. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever, not after the order of Levi, but after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, because Jesus was fully God and fully man, he was the only begotten Son of God. This Jesus was born of a virgin, so he was fully human and yet God in the flesh. And we learn about his days in the flesh in Hebrews 5, 7, who in the days of his flesh when he, meaning Jesus, had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, meaning what we would call God the Father, Jehovah Jireh, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, hallelujah. He was heard, Jesus is a man, was heard in that he feared. And whenever you see this, you must understand that Christ was filled with all the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It speaks of the seven spirits of God in Revelation. But it also speaks of the seven, six out of the seven, the three couplets of three couplets, six in Isaiah 11. And if you will see that it was the spirit of the fear of the Lord that would come upon Jesus when he was a man and give him quick understanding and discernment in the fear of the Lord, that he would not judge according to the hearing of his eyes, nor approve by the seeing by the hearing of his ears or the seeing of his eyes, but with righteous judgment. Hallelujah. Jesus would judge even the poor with equity. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. By the fear of the Lord, men depart from iniquity. The fear of the Lord is so beautiful, friend. I, I would just say that that's why I want to get into the book of Proverbs. So if you believe in Jesus Christ, know that Hebrews 5, 7, and 8 says this, though he were a son, capital S, even in the days of his flesh, it said, yet he learned obedience, not that he was disobedient. And your children need to learn obedience. They need to be trained. And you know how he was trained? By the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation, and there's a condition here, unto all that obey him. And now back into the book of Proverbs. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. I paid a lot of money to go to college, both at Bates College and Lewiston, Maine. I was going to go on and get a PhD in Jesuit theology and become a Jesuit priest. But then I actually started reading the Bible and found a scripture in Paul's letter to Timothy, first letter, chapter 3. A bishop should be the husband of one wife. And I must say, that stopped me in my tracks, literally. I wrote to them, and I said, well, you know, I really do believe I want to be married. They actually wrote back. My wife remembered this. We were friends at the time. She remembered. They actually wrote me back, said, well, you could still get a doctorate in theology and become a, a sort of a Jesuit, but not a priest. You could teach it different Catholic universities. But I started reading the Word of God. And I must tell you that I've read other people that have started reading the Word of God, and they just threw everything out, everything but the kitchen sink, and they began not to believe anything. Well, there were certain things that I grew up with that I admire. There were certain things I learned from my parents that I believe were good. But when I began to read the word of God, I, I found out that Jesus said, 
Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So I realized, wow, I've got to study. And over the years, the Lord brought me deeply into the book of Proverbs. Now in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, the first section was the intro 1 to 6. The next section is a kind of a pre-instruction to the family, to the children in the family, particularly the son. He tells his son, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But now look at the second half. Because if you read and study on your own, and I hope you will, the book of Proverbs, you're going to find out that the fear of the Lord is so often contrasted against the spirit of foolishness and the fool. He says, but fools, these are contrasted the one to the other throughout the entire book of Proverbs, friend. But fools despise, think about that word, despise wisdom and instruction. And I wrote down some thoughts on that. And I hope I can find it here. What, where is it here? See, I know I'm not on the radio. I have to remember that. So if you give me a moment. Yes. What do you think about when you hear fools despise wisdom and instruction? First of all, it is an utter contrast to a person who chooses to fear God. And the spirit, the Holy Spirit of the fear of the Lord is real. It is real. So I just jotted down some quick thoughts. The fool dismisses wisdom and instruction. That's right, the teachings of Jesus, the very teachings of God to his own covenant people. Yes, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But it's dismissed as insignificant. It's not practical. It's unnecessary for worldly success. So people despise it. They hold it in disregard, not in high regard. This is what they do, not only with the fear of the Lord, they do this with all the teachings. They despise the born-again believers. They despise the Jewish people. It's true. And yet they like to quote certain scriptures, but not the whole word of God. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. In other words, they dismiss God's words, teaching, wisdom, instruction, counsel, etc., as insignificant, not that important, not practical, unnecessary for success. And that's a, that's a grief to me, and I did not want my children, because I knew they would be tempted as I was to go astray. You see, they can't be in my home forever. But that's why I poured the Word of God in them, and when they left for college, to be honest with you, I was so busy with our own Christian school it's not that I didn't love my own boys and girls, but I wasn't thinking about them all the time. Out of sight, out of mind. They were in much more communication with mom. And I wonder if sometimes they think I didn't care. I don't know, but but I did what I could. And I still pray, of course. So he pleads with his son. My son, don't despise what I'm saying to you. He says, hear the instruction of thy father. And this is important. And forsake not the law of thy mother. To be honest with you, moms that have got it going on, they have their rules for the household. They have their law that they transmit to their sons and daughters. And the father, as the overseer, as the head of the house, and remember, it's not authoritarianism. It's nurture and admonition, dear men. It's kindness. The fear of the Lord does not produce pride. The fear of the Lord does not produce simplicity. The fear of the Lord does not produce anger. The fear of the Lord does not produce the wrath of man. The fear of the Lord does not produce intemperance in spirit or in physical habits like drinking, drugs, pornography. It's by the fear of God. To, it's not just reverence. That's part of it. But it's not merely reverence. The fear of the Lord, if it's to depart from evil, you have an understanding. You have a clear vision like, if I'm going to make heaven, I better stop. Why do you think it later says in the book of Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil? 
by the fear of the Lord, men depart from iniquity. Why would they bother? Because sin has a consequence. Not only in this life, but sin separates us from the blessings and favor of God. Now, he made a way back for all of us through Christ. That's why he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's very inclusive for the ones that take the right path. But it is exclusive to those that reject Jesus. The Father, it pleased that in Jesus, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily would dwell. And if you reject Jesus, you are believing a lie about your own human self-perfection. Not going to happen. Do the best you can. Be moral. Do good works. But everyone has sinned and come short of the glory of God. So you think the preaching of Christ brings you into condemnation? No. It's the sins you're in that bring you into condemnation. Jesus says, he that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Even if you've been proud and haughty and scornful and really super intelligent, maybe you got more money than me. Maybe you've made this world system work for you. And I don't fault you if you get well paid for a good education and a job well done. That is not enough to save your soul, however. I must tell you this. Not because I hate people that have money and I'm jealous of you. If I have Jesus and you don't, I have eternity above you. That's the truth. And it's not because of how wonderful I am. It's because of how wonderful Jesus is. So he pleads with his son. He teaches his son, my son. I love when I think about my sons and I think about their children now. And I think about my daughters and how they kept themselves. My son, hear the instruction of thy father. You see, you got to listen, but it's not just for the dads. You got to pay attention to your mama. Forsake not the law of thy mother. You see, there's blessings in obedience. There's no blessing in sin. There are blessings in obedience. Solomon even concluded at the end of the book of Ecclesiastes. What did he say? How many of you may know it? <laughs> Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And Solomon messed up in his lifetime, even though God had gifted him with wisdom. The carnality of the fleshly lust of the eyes. He married many strange women. Solomon got in trouble. God was angry with him because he had given him so much, but he turned to the charms of heathen and probably very good looking women. But beyond that, there was the lust of the eyes in his life. I believe he got back with God. I believe Ecclesiastes shows that Solomon got back with God. But he really genuinely displeased God. You know, the Bible says when he was born and David and Bathsheba were now properly married because her husband was dead, Uriah had died, that it said about Solomon when he was a boy, the Lord loved him. He was so pleased that when God said, ask of me what you want. And Solomon asked not for riches and honor, but he asked for wisdom. And God blessed him because of that. And he increased his monarchy. It was unbelievable. But even he fell into the lusts of the flesh. That's why we need to fear God and keep his commandments. Why do you think Solomon ended Ecclesiastes with that verse? Why do you think he said, fear God? That's right. Even Paul said, knowing the terror of the Lord, we seek to, we persuade men. And you see, God is not to be trifled with. He is God. He has always been God. And the fact is that he is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Therefore, he will not let unrepentant sinners and unbelievers and the fearful and the unbelieving, in the book of Revelation, says they're not making heaven. But he will not turn anybody away if they would come to him, humbling themselves before the mighty hand of God, not before me, 
before God himself. And the father tells the son, and I believe it's for the daughters too, for they shall be the instruction of your father and the law of your mother will be an ornament of grace. This is not legalism. It's grace unto thy head and chains, not bondage, but decorative, chains about thy neck. Very beautiful, very pleasant looking. Just, it's so precious, the word grace. Look at the word grace. You see, when you obey your father and your mother, when you honor your father and mother, it was the first commandment with a promise that it would be well with thee and that thou mayest live long upon the earth. To honor your mother and father has to be independent of the kind of character they have or the choices they make. When you honor your mother and father, when they're wonderful people, that's a good thing. And when you honor your mother and father, even though they may not have done you right or done each other right, but you honor them. And when you honor your mother and father, you're not giving them blanket approval for any things they need to get right with God, even as much as you're going to need to get right with God. When I went to pray for my alcoholic mother, God would not let me go any further until I faced myself in the light of Christ's love. He said to me directly, Ray, you hate your mother. No man said that to me. I was not even thinking it. I heard God. The Bible says my sheep hear my voice. He knew me by name. He used my name. He was kind, firm, and direct. And the effect of him telling me that was deliverance and redeeming virtue. I fell on my face before God Almighty and wept and repented. And within minutes, I was driving home to go find my mother, no matter what condition she was in, to throw my arms around her and say, Mom, I love you and mean it. She burst into tears, buried her head into my chest. And then I was able to begin to pray for her in a way that pleased God. God was basically telling you, telling me, not that he didn't care about my mother. I don't want you to be deceived into thinking I'm listening to you, Ray, until you get straightened out with me. Because we can get straightened out with God. And you may not know. I did not know. I thought I was doing a noble thing when I began to pray for my mother because now I'm born again and she's not. Well, you know, God loved my mother more than I did. And he pointed it out to me. And I'll tell you what, it undid me in a good way. Remember Isaiah and Isaiah 6? When he saw the Lord, he said, oh, woe is me, I am undone. When God said that to me, and it was the, the most wonderful thing he could have done, to tell me the truth that I was not thinking about. But the effect of it was to change the direction of my life and my relationships forever. And in ultimately, God won the victory, victory as he did in me for my own mom and others. Hallelujah. I just want to encourage you. I know I ramble a bit, but when you honor your mother and father and tell your sons, and you know, I know what we say, you say, do what I tell you, and the children will say, why? Because I said so. <laughs> but we have to get beyond that and sit down and say, like Peter says in his letter, come, children, come unto me, hearken unto me, and I will teach you. This is from the Old Testament, and Peter brought it into his letters. Come, I think it's Psalm 34. Come, you children, I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Have them sit at your feet. Have them shut their devices off. Maybe you got to spend some time with God before you do this. And then he gets down to the nitty gritty with his son. Verses 10 through 19. And we'll close tonight with these verses. Proverbs 1. The gang mentality, the going with sinners is nothing new under the sun. The temptation to go along, especially when they're teenagers and beyond, to go along, to get along, to fit in, even when it's not good. The father is warning him, discussing it with him. I love this. 
If sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Let your children learn that they have the right and you support it to not just say no, to say no and to know why. If they say, because it could happen, come with us. Notice the word us. A sense of belonging. I know that there are, even in our tiny capital city of Hartford, there are gangs in Hartford. I've known people that have gotten out of these gangs because they chose to get out and were beaten within an inch of their life, but they made it out and they are now born again young men. Years later. I don't know what the gangs are called in your cities. I think the words were like Latin kings and 20 love. And maybe they still exist today. Drugs, violence. I ministered in the prisons and I saw a young teenage boy or young whippersnapper in tears, frightened beyond belief, sitting in the pews at the old Morgan Street Jail. And we went up and talked with them and ministered to them and he was crying in fear. You see, to get in, he had to go steal a car. And of course, he stole the car. And guess what? He got caught. We would pray for those men. They would get in line. Many of them were still high on drugs when we were praying for them because this was a staging area till they went to different, till they were arraigned or had trials or were sentenced or released. But you see, even in college, there were people that wanted me to get drunk with them. I resisted for almost all the way through my junior year. And one day, I finally got tired of saying no. I wasn't born again. But I knew that I would be weak if I started to drink. If they say, come with us. This is more serious than that. But in one sense, it could have killed me that night. Let us lay wait for blood. You'd think any child in their right mind say, uh, no thanks. <laughs> Let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. What about abortion? Can you be anybody me be more innocent? The most dangerous place in America is in the womb. It's happening less and less, praise God. But it's murder. It's taking of a life. Now God can forgive and God can even heal the, the post-traumatic stress syndrome for even of having had abortions and the guilt, and the shame, and the hiding of it. And God will forgive you. God will. But you have to go to him. It's not because I'm being forthright or nice and say, oh, yeah, but you're going to be okay. No, you need to go to God. Let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. See, the father knows all the lines they're going to use. So he's letting the child know ahead of time. Don't just let them figure it out for themselves. I've known parents that have this laissez-faire, passive uh, approach to, to, to uh, teaching their children. You can teach them academics, but there's got to be more than that. You can give them music lessons. There's got to be more than that. You can They could be great athletes, and you're yelling and rah, 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 and all that's got its place. But you better talk to them about real life. And you may say, well, that'll never happen to them. Tell that to people that get hooked on meth coming from good families. And somebody at school just gave them a little hit of something for free. It's never for free. And everything changed. The relationship with their parents, their friends, their siblings changed. Maybe you're one of those people. And you see, this father, and really I look at it as God, our Heavenly Father, let us swallow them down into the pit. See, it's not that they don't know that there is a hell. They think somehow in their youth, they're immune. And then, of course, there's the promise of gain, ungodly gain. We shall find all precious substance. Notice the us, the we, you're part of something. We shall fill our houses with spoil. You know, there can be white collar criminals that do this too. Cast in thy lot upon us among us. It's like voting for them. Let us all have one person. That sounds like, frankly, full-blown socialism and communism. Now, that may seem too broad a comparison, but that's what they're saying. We'll all have one purse. Oh, and the powers that be 
will equitably give you everything that you worked for. Have you ever studied the beginnings of America when they had the common store in Jamestown and it utterly failed because it was ideal? Everybody put something in. And so everybody contributes and then people can go to the common store and take out whatever they want. Well, the problem is there were people that didn't want to do anything and they took out what was just like the run on toilet paper. They took out everything that they could get and the people that were willing to work couldn't keep up with their demands. It's human nature. Now, I'm not here to extol the virtues of false capitalism based on greed and exploitation. But even God says in the millennium, every man's going to have his own vine and every man's going to have his own fig tree. Amen? The small businesses generate most of the income in this country, and yet they're going to crush them, acting like they're looking out for us. They're protecting us. Think this through. Do you know they tried the common store approach in New England when we were first founded? And they quickly saw what was happening, and they abandoned it. And they began to have people being rewarded for their work, rewarded for their labor. Don't you do that for children that do well in school? Don't you want to be honored and get a promotion and a raise because you deserve it at work? If you have employees, are you going to reward the ones that are just getting by and they don't have any further interest? They're, They're putting in their time. Okay, cool. But if they come to you for a raise based on merit, are you going to give them that raise? Oh, because you're just so socially pure? Listen, this may seem to be off topic, but you all need to be praying for the United States of America. And you need to pray for the leaders because people are, you know, in fear and panic. Now, I believe Isaiah 26, that will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Why? Because he trusteth in thee, Lord. That's where I am at today. Because I have peace that passes understanding. A peace even in the midst of tribulation. If I die, I know I'm going to heaven. It doesn't mean I get callous or casual. Friends, this is nothing new under the sun. The temptation to want to belong is strong among young people. And so the father teaches him in verse 15. My son. He can't force his son. There is a certain discipline and training in my way or the highway. But as they get into their teen years, you can no, longer, can no longer only be in front of them. You must learn to walk beside them and talk about God. Talk about your experiences. Talk about your failures in the proper context with them. Tell them what you learned even about your own weaknesses that God helped you overcome. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. In other words, it will be a choice, son, if you do it. So don't choose to it. Refrain thy foot. Your natural tendency would be to go with them. He's telling his son, you've got to make a decision to refrain thy foot from their path. And he explains more. Their feet run to evil and make haste to shed in blood. But then he reminds them that there's going to be a consequence for these apparently impervious sinners. There is a God, friend. There is a God of justice and judgment and equity. And he tells his son, surely in vain, the net is spread in the sight of any bird. The son would know that. There's no way a bird will fly into a net that they can see with their natural eyes. They won't do it. So you have to be craftier than that to catch him. And so he tells them, and they will lay wait. Son, they're telling you how they're going to conquer and have the power. They don't get it. They're laying wait for their own blood. They lurk privily for their own lives. And it can happen in finances. It can happen in property. It can happen in cheating and stealing and abuse of power even among very intelligent people. They lurk privily, privately for their own lives. And he ends this part of the instruction. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. 
There are people you will hear in the Chris, in Christendoms, they'll actually be taught to say phrases, money come to me. Well, I don't buy that. You can ask God to release finances. You can ask God for blessings upon you and your friends. Bible says the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just, for the righteous. But you don't get it by ill-gotten means. I got an idea. If you want money to show up in a week or two, get a job and money will come to you. Now, some of you now, though, it's no joke. You don't know when your income is coming. I do hope they make good decisions in Congress for this present distress. But I have to tell you that if we do not start to get alone with God or get the family together with God to pray, then we're basically hoping that man will bail us out. God needs to put the fear of God. If, our, if we're going to be saved as a country, the fear of God has to come back into our leaders. That's right, the fear of God himself. In President Trump, Vice President Pence, all of the leaders in Congress, the Senate, the House of Representatives, the Supreme Court, all the courts, and everyone, Paul wrote, let every one of you that name the name of Christ depart from iniquity. By the fear of the Lord, men depart from iniquity. They take away the life of the owners thereof, and they don't care. No matter how polished they look on TV, no matter what side of the political spectrum they're on, if they do not fear God, their political position and power will not get them to heaven. About money, Paul said, the love of money is the root of all evil. And he told Timothy, his son in the faith, if you run into people that suppose that gain equals or is godliness, evidence of real relationship with God, he said, from such, turn away. Now, I'm thankful. I have no idea if we want an hour or more, but I'm thankful to be with you. Now, the father is speaking to his son. What happens next that we'll get into next week is so amazing. The Holy Spirit begins to speak. And you can read ahead. That would be good. There is so much here to share daily with one another. And I hope that you will share and publish this word far and wide. I am not going to be anti any party. But God is not impressed with man. David in the Psalms actually prayed, put the nations and the leaders in fear, the fear of God, that they may know themselves to be but men. If you are entangled so politically with the affairs of this life, you cannot please God who has called you to be a soldier of the cross. And that means if you are on one side of the political spectrum, does it even occur to you to genuinely pray for people from both parties? Because their souls matter. Even if you don't like their leanings. If you're born again, you're made to sit together in heavenly places with Jesus Christ, far above all principality and power. So be not entangled with the yokes of this world's bondage and fear of man, fear of circumstance. What is it King David said? I sought the Lord, and he delivered me from all my fears. That's not being delivered from the fear of God. The fears that he sought deliverance from in closing today, the fear of timidity and cowardice, timidity and cowardice, the fear of having guilt because you're separated from God, people that have the wrong kind of fear, the fear of man bringeth a snare. Sin will be justified and will dominate your life when you do not fear God. If you are coming to Christ and yet you have the wrong kind of fear, you're not yet made perfect in love, but perfect love will cast out all the above fears I've just mentioned. The fear of death, he'll cast it out. The fear of man, he'll cast it out. Timidity, he'll cast it out. It won't make you passive. 
It'll make you active. You'll act, but with a right spirit and a right mind. So my brethren, and we'll get into it in chapter two, choose to fear God. Read more than we've shared today. Amen.